Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Fusion 360 live stream. Today, I'm your host, Jason Lichtman, and we are going to be doing something special. Today is June 18th, and Father's Day is going to be just around the corner this Sunday. Now, normally for Father's Day, Father's Days are usually filled with praise and love and things like that. But one of the things that I love about Father's Day is trying to be a better father. And for me, that means trying to spend time playing with my son and enjoying the time together. And one of the things that we love doing together is playing with those Brio style train tracks. You know the ones where you have those wooden train tracks, you make them in all sorts of shapes, and you send those trains all over the place. Well, we love playing with those, but one of the things that I found that happens is you end up losing or breaking pieces. In my case, one of the things that I just didn't have enough of, or maybe I lost them all. I'd love to blame him and say that he lost them, but you, you, you never know. But these little male and male connectors, and there are never enough of them. And so I thought to myself, well, I have Fusion 360, and even though Fusion might be a professional CAD software, once you have access to professional CAD, you can use it for all sorts of things that may not be as professional. Uh, in my case, I have a 3D printer, and I have Fusion 360. That should be enough to make some replacement pieces like this. And in addition to that, you might find yourself running out of pieces like this those female-female connectors. And again, Fusion 360 can come to the rescue. So today, I'm gonna show you how I spent some time in Fusion and created replacement parts for my Brio-style train tracks to play with, with my son, and in hopes that maybe you design your own train track parts and have time with your family together. Now, keep in mind, of course, that there's no prerequisite to being a father, to wanting to enjoy making train track parts. So if you are not a father, that's totally fine. You don't have to be male to make those train track parts either. For anyone out there that wants to learn how to make their own train track parts, this demonstration is gonna be for you. So let's jump right over to my screen for a second. This is exactly what we're after for today, designing those train track parts. Now you could see on the screen I have a whole lot of different kinds of parts. And by the way, you don't need to make an assembly on the screen. I'm just trying to show you all sorts of different parts together and how they could be brought together. But these are just a couple of the different train track parts that I made, and I'm going to teach you how to make them. But again, before we go there, we're going to start by showing you some of the options you have available because I think once you start to design your own train track parts, you're going to find that you might end up making some pretty cool stuff that just simply doesn't exist anywhere else, right? So I have a whole lot of parts. I mean, let's take a look here. I don't know if your house looks like mine, but this is our train track parts, and that's a lot of different parts. But we're going to go and make some custom ones. Now, not all of those parts are exactly suitable for 3D printing, but most of them actually are. And so let's go and take a look at some of those together. We're going to go into my data panel, and you're going to see here I made a replacement fuel tanker, so the top of the train itself you could see on the screen at the moment. I also made things like this double height bridge. I'll actually show you the real one. So that'll be this part right here. So I can actually 3D print my own bridges. I also did the standard height bridge for comparison purposes. That'll be the standard height bridge. Let's also, let's get into the good ones, right? Like the male male connectors, those are really easy. You know, you can print a whole lot of those at the same time. So in this case, you can see I have a whole baggie of them. But once you start to kind of open, open up the possibilities, you'll see that you can make things like 45 degree crossings like this one, or 90 degree crossings like this one you see on the screen. You can start to go a little bit crazy and have a whole lot of crazy crossings like this one you see on the screen right here and then you can also start to get into things like clover leaves so i think that is this one that you see right here right and this makes the train tracks a whole lot of fun
So you can do a whole lot of cool stuff with it. Just so you could see where this is headed, let me show you some options. Actually, I'll tell you a little bit more background about what I was using them for. So my son and I, we would have a weekly ritual and every Monday we would go and create a new train track set. And then for the entire week, we would end up being able to play with whatever configuration we made. You know, one of my friends went out and he bought a like $400 train track table that had everything already set up, which is kind of awesome, but everything was glued down. So you couldn't actually change the shape of the tracks. And on one hand, that's kind of awesome because your child won't be able to just destroy everything. But on the other hand, it means there's, there's no actual creativity in what you're designing or like the shape or, you know, what it's going to end up being. So what I decided to do is that every Monday, my son and I would create a train track set together. He would play with it for the entire week. And then the next week we would end up destroying it and making a whole new one. So just so you could see some possibilities, I'll show you a couple of our examples. Now, some of these images are quite old. My son's much older than in some of these pictures. But here you could see, oh, that one's totally backwards. Let's go and fix that. Hold on. Oh, no, it shows up fine. Uh, nope, there it was. There it is. So uh, we'll fix that one more time. Live streams, they're not perfect. So here you could see quite a few different options for these train track shapes. And in all cases, right, it's all using these custom pieces to make all sorts of shapes. Some of these are wiggly, some of them are not wiggly. Some of them are all on the main level. Some of them are, you know, more on the like one level up bridge or two levels up. All of them are different from week to week. And that's what makes this so fun. I can't tell you the, I mean, the joy that it brings me spending time with my son is awesome. And I got to do this every week for the last several years. And so I hope you end up finding as much enjoyment as I have. All right, again, these are just a couple of examples. So we're gonna show you how to design this. And I'm actually gonna show you how I designed this, which was years ago, and then how I would design it differently today. Because A, my experience has changed, and B, the software itself has gotten much better over time. So there are some features available now that just simply were not around when I first designed this. And I'll show you both how I designed it at the time and how I would design it today. Again, just a couple of examples here of the kinds of things we're talking about. So let's jump into Fusion and we're gonna start by designing the most basic of all. We're gonna start by designing just the straight connector and you know, this would be called, I believe, a male-female connector, and you could have different lengths. I'm going to go and show you my 100 millimeter length. All right. Now, what this all begins with is a sketch. The sketch you could see here on the timeline, it's the top view. And then you'll also see that I have the profile view and a couple of extrudes. So let's go and take a look at that. We're actually going to go and start off by looking at, I think the profile view would be more interesting. Let's go and take a look at that and I'll hide my body for a moment. So this is the sketch of our piece. Now, all you really need to start this is one piece of real track, original track that you didn't design yourself, and one set of calipers. You could use measuring tape, but I think you're gonna have a hard time getting that to be accurate. You could use something like an engineering rule, which is like a metal fancy ruler. Uh, that's awesome. Still not going to be nearly as easy or as accurate as calipers. So I'd recommend calipers. They don't need to be these monster long calipers. They would just be regular calipers. And these days you can get calipers for 20 or $30. So I highly encourage you to either get them or use them. We'll go and turn these on. And you could see this is the track. You could actually go and take this and put it in a scanner. But the reality is that this shape is really basic. All right, so we're gonna go and draw this and then we'll go and put in our measurements and we'll take it from there. And let's go and start from scratch. I'm gonna make a new design. The first thing I always recommend is that you start off by saving your design. I always say that because autosave isn't gonna work unless you've saved the first time. We're gonna go and call this train track cross section. There we go. We're gonna go and turn on our origin. This is especially important if you're a beginner turn on that origin, choose whichever plane you want to draw on, and we're going to go and create a quick sketch. Now, normally I tell people that if you know your part is symmetric, draw one half, that's going to save you a whole lot of time. 
but there are certain cases where that's not true or that's not recommended. In this particular case, I'm gonna draw the entire cross section because when we end up trying to turn this into the shape, you know, it's not just gonna be about extruding it. We might end up also sweeping it to make kind of more of the curvy sections like this one, or this is a 45 degree curve or maybe the 90 degree curve. We're gonna to wanna to be able to do those sweeps with the whole profile. So we're gonna draw that whole profile as well. So let's start off by drawing a line. Now, you might have seen this in Brad's videos and in mine, but when you draw a line and it's nearly horizontal, it'll automatically snap and give you that constraint. You could see that icon right over here for horizontal. And if you don't like that and you wanna add those constraints yourself, intentionally draw the line at like a pretty big angle, and then you could go and apply the constraint and make that horizontal. The last option is you can go and draw it just pretty horizontal, but if you hold control, it'll disable the automatic constraints. So in this case, it's pretty much horizontal, but not actually horizontal. We'll make that horizontal by, again, adding that constraint. Now, I don't really need three lines. I was just using that for demonstration. So let's delete those two. And we're going to go and add a midpoint constraint between this line and this point, that origin. And now everything is lined up nicely. Let's go and complete our profile. So just taking a look at this, again, I'll show you. That's the profile that we want, something like that. We'll go and draw this up pretty quickly. So it looks like there's a straight section, a slight chamfer, a horizontal, another chamfer, something like that, a vertical, horizontal, and I think you guys get the idea here. Now, when I said earlier that I'm gonna make sure to draw the whole thing, what I really meant is I'm gonna have the whole thing visible. I am in still, still in this case going to just draw half I'm probably just gonna go and use the mirror command for me. So actually, now that I'm thinking about it, let's get rid of that midpoint constraint and I'll go and fix that horizontal line like there. That's actually looking much better. All right, so this is looking pretty good. We're gonna go and add that chamfer, that horizontal, and this guy. That's looking great. Now, one thing to note is that as I'm drawing, it automatically applies constraints. And that's not always the exact constraint that I would want. Again, as I'm drawing, I could hold the control key and it just wouldn't apply those constraints. So if I wanted to do that same thing again real quickly and not have these perpendicular constraints, I could do the same thing and I'll just do it over here for a second. Holding control, I could go and draw that basic shape. And again, it's not applying those constraints. Now you'll notice I just drew that absolutely horrifically, and that's fine too, because using those constraints, it's automatically gonna reposition everything. And so I can draw something and have it be ugly and it'll still fix itself. If you have the constraints and you just don't want them, select the constraints themselves, just like this, and then just select delete on your keyboard. Just that easy. Now we'll go and apply the constraints I do want. So I want that to be vertical, this to be horizontal, this is horizontal, that's vertical, vertical, horizontal, and vertical. Pretty easy. Now I also want to add additional constraints. So for example, I could go and apply a quick little center line right here. And using that center line, I could go and apply symmetry between this line, this line, and my center line. And I could also go and apply, let's say, the horizontal constraint between that point and this point. That'll make those line up with each other. That's great. And we'll also go and add a collinear. Actually, let's take a look at this. Yeah, we're going to go and add a collinear constraint between this line and that one so that those line up correctly. Perfect. And I guess I'm going to go and just take this line and make that construction. And we'll go and take not all of this, but most of this. We'll go and double click to select everything in the chain. And I'll hold control and deselect this bottom line there, that horizontal. And we'll go and use the mirror tool and I'll go and mirror that across the center line. Perfect. Oh, and you know what? Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I should have also selected that bottom. There we go. Much better. All right, so at this point, I have a bunch of constraints. They're taking up a lot of my visual, all right? It's taking a lot of my window. I don't think I'm gonna need to mess with those constraints very much anymore. So I'm just gonna go and uncheck this show constraints, and that looks much better. 
Now we could go and add our dimensions, and this is where the calipers come in handy. So using the caliper, I'm going to go and measure the width of our part. That is 39.94 millimeters. I like millimeters. You don't have to use those, of course. And we're going to go here and set this. Right now, you'll see it's 176. But I have an option turned on in my preferences, which is on by default for you as well. And so if I come in here and I type in 39.94, it'll automatically scale my entire model so I don't have to worry about the proportions all of a sudden getting really wacky when I change that. I'll also go and add a dimension for the thickness. In this case, we'll go and measure that. 12.3. Pretty good. My chamfers got a little funny, so I'll probably go make those a little smaller. Oh, and I am also going to add a horizontal constraint there too. That looks good. Excellent. Let's go and add a dimension for this depth. And that's why I like calipers, right? I can go in here and use the little pointy end of the calipers. Yeah, you can't see that very well. Let's go make that stick out a little bit. And there we go. That looks like it's three millimeters. I can go and measure the width as well. I'll go and put that is going to be, and this time I'll use the pointy section right here, six millimeters. Now, by the way, you should measure your track, right? Don't just use my numbers because Brio is not the only company that makes these, and I want to make sure that yours is going to work for you. So make sure to measure your track and don't just use my numbers, of course. All right, but here I have my basic numbers. Now, for the chamfer itself, I can go and pick, let's say, this angle, and we'll go and set... Uh, no, I don't like that angle. Let's go and delete that. I'm going to go and set it over here to 45. That looks pretty good. I'll go and set this one also to 45. Pretty good. And I'll also go and set a dimension on this, maybe a millimeter and a half. Now, you might need to experiment with this, and that's totally fine, too. Right? We're going to go and measure the width over here, and that'll be 4.4. 4.4. And you might even want to consider, actually, based on this, like really di dimensioning this rather than like the wall thickness, you might want to measure like center to center of like the track because that's where like the wheels are going to go. Or if you want to make this even more accurate than the actual ones that you bought, you might want to go and take your train and measure the spacing between those wheels. And that would be a more accurate way to do it as well. The point here simply is you put in your dimensions for the shape and overall this is looking really good. Now, I'm going to go and save this design right away because what I'm going to show you is that the way I designed this a long time ago is very different than the way I design it today, and this is going to be important. So when I save this, it's going to ask for the description, and I'm going to say first attempt at cross section. Perfect. Now, I'm going to show you those two ways, and to do that, I'm going to actually copy this file. So we'll have two versions of this. All right, not really two versions. We're going to have two different files entirely. So let's go and copy this. And we're going to rename the second one. So one of these is going to be just the cross-section itself. And the other one is going to be our like test part. And this is going to be called train track design old method. Perfect. So let's go with the old method first, because there's nothing wrong with the old method. The newer method that I use is a little bit trickier to set up, but once you set up, has really good advantages that I think you're going to like. So let's show you the original method first. The original method was to take a sketch like this, then I could go, and if I just want to make one of those straight sections, the extrude tool is perfect, and extrude this to however long you want, and all you need to do at this point is make a, a like not a cross section, a sketch from above to actually cut out like the male section and the female section of the train track, right? So that's pretty straightforward. But where this is going to get more interesting is that before I do that cutout, I could actually go and delete the extrude, and I could go and draw maybe a different way to do this. Let's go and create a sketch. And I'll show that original section that's right over here. We'll go and draw maybe a straight line. And then I'm going to go and draw a big arc, something like that. And then maybe another straight line. Perfect. Of course, this is still adjustable. But what I could also do is I could use the sweep tool. 
and I could grab that cross section, grab for my path this new sketch, and now I have a very custom shape. Again, I would put the male and the female on the ends, and then it's actually going to be able to connect to something, right? So this would be how you'd make something like that 90 degree turn that I showed earlier, or where was it? Somewhere here, that 45 degree turn I showed just a few minutes ago as well. Where this can get even more interesting, if you'd like it to be, is you could go and edit this sketch, and you could have multiple shapes all together. So actually, let's go and make a new sketch. It'll probably be smarter. So this is, and let's name everything. So this would be the cross section. This would be the path, but I'll call this path number one. And then I can also go in and create another sketch here. And we're going to go and hide my body for a moment, draw a straight line. And let's do the same thing like we did before, but using these two as the combination. So we're going to do another sweep, which in this case for a straight line would be equivalent to an extrude. But um, it gives you more versatility because you could change that shape anytime you want. And I'm going to go and change, I'm going to grab that profile, grab this line, and hit OK. It's giving me a little warning that the object that I'm making isn't visible, and that makes sense because I turned off the visibility a minute ago. But if I turn on the visibility, you'll see that I now have two bodies. And granted, I have a little bit of a problem where they're connecting together, but this is the basic way that you're going to end up designing something like this part, right? Where there's a straight section and a curve. Right? You take something like this and you end up extruding or sweeping a cut section and now you're really talking. Now you have a lot of options. So let's go to the basic one first and we'll get to this in just a little bit. So let's start off like I was saying. I'm going to go and actually we'll just suppress a chunk of this in this model. This will be fine. And let's unsuppress these two. That's what I meant. There we are. So now I have a straight section. And the next part of this is going to be figuring out the size of the male and the female areas, right? So we're going to go and create a sketch from above, right? Look at this from above or below. It doesn't actually matter, but I like the top view. And what we're going to end up doing is we're going to draw this shape that you see here and this shape. Now I could draw one on one side and one on the other side. But before I do, let me point out something that's actually pretty important for this to work. Right? When you start to put these together, like I'm doing here, you'll see that there's always a really good gap between those two parts. Right? This looseness is actually important for a couple of things. Well, number one, when you start to put something together in like a big loop, they're not always going to line up perfectly. So it does give you a little bit of room for misalignment like that. Right? But in addition to that, it just means that it's easier to actually put these two together. And I'll tell you, when I first made these, I didn't do as good of a job. And the reality is that even today, when I go and I build train tracks with my son, I find that some of these parts don't actually fit together the way that I wish that they did. And so the trick that I found is to design the shape using an average of the two. So average the female area and average the male area and then use an offset to be able to make the changes when you need to. So let's actually go and do that. So the trick is, let's go and start and draw the shape itself, right? So in this case, I'm gonna go and draw a quick rectangle. Oh, hold on, R for rectangle is what I meant. R for rectangle, and then I'm gonna go C for circle, and this is the basic shape. We'll go and trim, I just hit T for trim, and I'll trim off all this extra stuff. Right, I could hide that body, I don't really need that for now. I can also make sure to go and line everything up so that everything is nice and straight. So I'll go and make a quick center line. I like to make a construction and make it vertical. Oh, that got a little big on me, that's okay, we'll fix that. And let's also go and make this area here symmetric as well. Good. Then I'll also go and add a fillet here and here. And we'll also go and add, actually, let's just see what's going on here. I have a couple of like projected lines that I don't really want, so we'll just go and delete those. And this is looking much better overall, really, really good. So let's actually go and take this. We'll make this a horizontal line. We'll connect this all together. 
let's use my coincident command and I'll trim out the middle because what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to also add the fillets over here and over here. Perfect. All right, so at this point, everything is adjustable. So the question becomes, what size should everything be? Right? And what I'm going to suggest is you take the male area and you take the female area and you average them. Right? So we're going to go and measure the diameter of the male area. It's 11.5. I could go and take the female area and that's about 12.5. And so the average on that is going to be 12. So go there and we're going to go and set that to be 12. Perfect. Same thing with this area over here. So let's go and set this. Right now it's showing a 7.1. That's probably not accurate. We'll go and measure the male area. It's about six. And then the female is about seven. So let's go with six and a half. And again, right now, don't don't follow my numbers. I'm, I'm doing this very quickly, right? So the idea is you're going to go and take all the measurements, set this up how you want, right? Get this to be accurate. And once you're ready, this is going to be locked and loaded, so to speak, right? You have that shape. Now, at this point, we're going to end up being able to take this and extrude it. Now, I have an open sketch, and open sketches are not exactly extrudable, or at least not for solid geometry. So I might also want to go back into the sketch and close this off. I could just go and put a line from here to here. That's good enough to close this off. And now I could go and take this, and we'll go and use the extrude tool, and I'll extrude this until it gets to this top surface. Something like that. And by the way, if you ever have uh, what looks like kind of just a little funniness over here, you can also use like the direct editing tools in Fusion and select this face and just hit delete and it'll kind of clean it up. I have the feeling I know what's going on and it's a little more complex than that, so I'll kind of skip over that for now. But the general idea is you're going to be able to take that shape and use it as an extrude. And the thing to keep in mind, though, is that we use that nominal size, right, that average of the two, and you are going to want a gap. So the other thing you could do is once you created a solid geom, you could take a step back. You could edit your sketch and add an offset. That would be perfectly fine. You could do an offset in and an offset out and use it for different things. Also, you could go under Modify press pull and you can select these surfaces I'll hold control so I could select multiple here that's not the one I wanted oh um, and by the way I recommend new offset so we'll go and select these surfaces rotate around here that looks great and based on that gap which turns out is about a millimeter total I want to offset the male inwards half a millimeter and I want to offset the females outwards half a millimeter. So we're going to go and set this to 0.5. And if that ends up being the wrong direction, you could just put the minus symbol. Now, you guys are really perceptive. So you're probably noticing I am getting an error right now. And if I'm getting an error, it's probably being caused by that problem that I had. Oh, I know what the problem is. These live streams, right? It comes included with all of our mistakes, by the way. The problem here is that these are two separate bodies. So that's the problem. If I go back to this extrude command, all I have to do is change this from new body to join, and this will look much better, right? So now I have this one and this one. Oh, no, I still have these separate. And I bet you it's a problem on my sketch that there's just a slight gap that shouldn't be there. Um, I could go back and we can go and fix that. That is exactly the problem. So let's go and grab this point right here and this one and we'll make that coincident. Oh, I see, yeah, we don't have anything connecting the two. Let's go and project something from the bottom here. So I'll just go and project that line. And now I can hide that body. We'll make this construction and I'll go and make these collinear. Much better. Excellent. All right, so now let's go and try to fix that extrude again. So we'll go and edit our feature, and we're going to make this join. That's exactly what I was hoping for from the beginning. Perfect. Now I could go under that modify, press pull, select a face, change this to new offset, and I could pick these fillets all the way around, like so. 
and I could go and add that half a millimeter offset, or in this case, maybe it's going to be minus half, right? Make that a little smaller. So you would do this on both sides of your model, and on the other side, you're actually going to use it as a cut, and again, do that offset, and make sure to test the assembly to make sure that everything is looking right, but everything is going to line up well. Now, if anyone's really paying attention to like the big picture of how I modeled this, right? let's summarize for a second. I drew a sketch that was the cross section. I extruded it or I swept it. Then I drew another sketch that was the, like the male or the female ends. And I used that to extrude cut or to extrude join those areas together. But then I ended up having to do that over and over again, all sorts of places. Now, you'll notice that when you are talking about, let's say, a sketch of this like male area, then you might end up having to redraw that sketch over and over again in different places. The same is also going to be true with your cross section. And so let's go and take a look at what I did in the past. Like, uh, not that part. Let's go to this one. I think will be fine. No, we wanted the straight section. Let's go and grab that. I opened too many as it turns out, so we'll go and close a little bit. Uh, that one, almost there. The, nope, that's the one we were just looking at. Almost. Really? Let's go and find it. Now I can actually, there it is. This is the one. So again, I did exactly that, right? This time I changed the order a little bit. I did the sketch from above. Then I made the sketch of the profile. And I used that to actually go and make the the cut in this case actually let's go and take a look at it i use the intersect tool and i did an intersection between that blocky blocky shape and this shape and ended up with exactly what i wanted and all i had to do at the end was add a couple of fillets so this looks pretty good i'm going to show you a new technique that i think you guys are going to like better so remember we created a file here that was called train track cross section so what i could do is i could say make a new design Let's go and save this. And this is going to be called track example 100 mm straight, something like that. And what I could do here is I could say insert derive. And I could go and grab that same file. Let's go and move this over so I could see this. So what I'm looking for is the train track cross section file. And let's go and find that. I must not be seeing it properly. Train track cross section, that's the right name. There it is. Oh, sorry about that, everyone. So select the train track cross section. And what it's going to do is it's going to bring this directly into my new model. Now, why is that helpful? Because if you do it this way, now that, that cross section file can update all of your files. I mean, if you think about what I have here, I have all these straight sections and these curved sections and the split sections and the bridges and the dips and the curves and the everything. And if it turns out after I 3D printed a bunch of these, I figure out that I really should tweak those dimensions a little bit, I'm going to have to go in every single file and go and tweak those. But if I do it this way using the derive command, I could actually go and be able to adjust it in that original file and it'll update all of the subsequent files. Now there's only one thing I did wrong and that's kind of my fault. So when I went into the cross section you're going to notice here let's go and open that file by itself. This is a live stream so these things happen and that's okay right that's you learn from them and that's actually a really good thing. You'll notice that I created the sketch in what we call the root level. So this is really just a single file that has in it a sketch. When you use the derive command and all you have in that derived file is the sketch, it's automatically going to line up this sketch with the like origin to origin of this file. And so unfortunately now this train track example part has this cross section stuck in exactly this orientation. I can't really move it. So there's another technique or a slight difference in what I should have done that I think is actually really helpful and I'm glad I made the mistake because now you guys get to learn from it is that we're going to do the same thing but I'm going to make it as a component inside the file so let's go back to that cross-section file 
and that's not this one. That's this one. And what we're going to do is I wish I could just right click on the sketch and say create a component from the sketch or create a new component and then drag that sketch into. Oh, my gosh, we just learned something new. That was amazing. All right. We used to not be able to do that. I truly didn't think that was going to work. There must have been an update in Fusion. And I guess, Brad, you're on the keyboard. If you could figure out when that update was, I would love to know. I would truly love to know. But there was an update. And now, as it turns out, you can move a sketch into an existing component. Blew my mind. That's amazing. I learn stuff every day, but it's not usually in scenarios like this. So what I did was I just grabbed that sketch. Let's, let's do that again. That was awesome. All right, let's start again. I had this file and it had in it a sketch of the cross section. And I wished that I could just create a component from the sketch. You cannot do that even now. But I could say create a new component. The new component is going to be called, in this case, train track cross section, right? Sketch only. And I'm going to go and hit OK. So now I have this component. Now, the way that I used to have to bring in a sketch into another component or subcomponent would be I'd edit the sketch, select everything, hit Control C or Command C on a Mac to copy it, then go and make a new sketch in the new component and paste it. It actually worked fine. There was no real problem with it, except for that it was a bunch of extra steps. And what it turns out is that I could actually now grab the sketch and click and drag it into this subcomponent and it just moves. That's awesome. Uh, I'm never going to forget that. That's, that's great. And so now that I've done that, I have the sketch inside this subcomponent. The only other thing that I should do is I should go and make sure to lock in this component with respect to the assembly so it can't move by accident. I'll go and use an as-built joint and select this component and this root level. Make sure it's set to rigid and hit OK. Awesome. That was great. Now let's go and save this file. And we're going to go and say turned sketch into subcomponent. Awesome. And let's go and do the same thing that we did before. Now I could just update this derive, but I want to show you the difference. So let's go and hit the actually, no, let's leave this as is so I could show you that difference. And let's go and make a new design. We're going to save this one also train track example number two and this one's going to be called derived subcomponent just so you could see what we're talking about all right so in this file let's go and bring in the the sketch we say insert derive we're going to go and find that same file like i did a moment ago if i could of course find it there it is and hit select this time, when I go to select what I want to bring in, instead of choosing the sketch itself, I'm going to choose the subcomponent, and I'm going to go and say OK. The reason that this is going to be different is because now when I bring it, when I have this new train track example, it's going to bring in the sketch, but this one is actually movable, so I can actually move this wherever I want, and that's going to be really helpful. So if it turns out that I want to draw something that's like, you know, sideways relative to this, I could go and use assemble joint and I can go and choose, let's say, the bottom of this train track. And then I can go and set that to be related to something else, right? Related to anything else. So as an example, let's go, let's hide that for a moment. I'll go and draw just a big block here, right? So let's pretend this is going to be the length of my track. And we'll make this 300 millimeters, I guess. And I'll extrude this in height. Or you'll notice I'm not even making this the right size. That's OK. I could go and take that train track cross section. And I can go and say, let's make a joint. And I'll pick the very bottom middle here. And then I can go and pick the very bottom middle of the side view. And this time, it lines up. That's the real benefit here. And then I could go and use, hit OK. I could go and use the shape and do an extrude all the way through. And if I set this to be intersect, just like that, I now have a perfect train track shape. So the beauty here is that the train track cross section file 
can be used over and over and over again for all sorts of different train track parts. And if you go and edit, and let's actually go and do this for our example. Let's see, I think this was the cross section. Nope. Nope. There we go. I could go and edit this. And if I just adjust, let's say the height, and instead of 12.3, I make this 20, right? I'll exaggerate it just so you could see here. When I go and I hit save and I say update height to 20 mm, this will go and make a new version of the file automatically, right? We have a built in PDM system. And when I go into my other file, the one that was using it, you'll see here that it gives me the yellow warning, right? It's using V3 at the moment. I can update this and it'll automatically go and update that height. Did you guys see that? It's pretty cool. So derive wasn't a feature that existed when I did originally designed all these train track parts. And so I would recommend you use that today because that one file can reference or influence a whole lot of other designs. So let's take that even further, right? So I have the train track cross section file. I would recommend making another file here. We'll go and this time we'll be smarter from the beginning. We'll say new component. And this one's going to be called male female connection only. Perfect. And we're going to go and draw a quick sketch. And this time we're going to do the same thing, right? So just draw a horizontal line like this. We'll go and line that up. We can go and draw our rectangle. And I'm not going to go and put in all the details here, but the idea is simply you design this area like that. Perfect. And you can take this area. Let's pretend for a moment this is the right size, right? And if I want to make my life really easy, I could also go and take this sketch. And I could also do a couple of offsets. So if this is like the nominal shape, I could go and add, let's say, half of a millimeter in that direction. And then go and grab the same thing and do a half a millimeter in the other direction. Perfect. And we'll make the original construction because I'm not really going to use that ever. I'm probably going to use the inside or the outside. I can also go and connect these together like this one over there. And I think one over here would probably be fine. Right again, I, I'm simplifying this design at the moment. And we're going to go Oh, also add our joint, right? We don't want this to move. So we'll say shift J between this guy and this one. That's the as built joint. We'll make that rigid. And now we could go and save this design. And this is going to be called the male female connection only. Perfect. And then when I'm designing a part like this one, what I could do is I could say insert derive, choose, let's go and drag this out so I can see this, male female connection only. We'll go and choose that same thing like we did before. We'll go and choose this guy right there and hit OK. And you see that shape just showed up right there. And then what I could do is, again, using that J for joint, I could select what area here that I, I actually want to have this like connect with. And so in this case, you know what? I'm thinking to myself, I probably, I probably want this point right there, actually. And then I can go and grab the end of this particular part, rotate this, in this case, 90 degrees. And now I have this shape exactly where it needs to be. And I could go and use my extrude tool and extrude this until it gets to the surface. And we'll do a join command. That's pretty great. I would have this already detailed out with the fillets, of course. And then I'll do the same thing again. Insert derive, and we'll do that male-female connector. Choose that same item. That one. I actually deselected it by accident. We'll go and grab that. And then we'll do the same thing. I'll go J for joint. This time we're going to do reverse, actually. So I'll go and grab, let's say, that point. Select the very end here. And instead of this sticking out, we'll rotate it the other way. There we are. And then using the extrude tool again, select, let's, oh, we need the bigger one this time. And I think I messed up on the other file just a little bit. right? I would need to have this blocked off over there and over there so I could extrude this properly. All right, so I'll just uh, simplify this for a moment. 
and we're going to go and take that and say let's extrude this all the way through as a cut right so the point here is simply that you have two files that one that represents the cross section one that represents the male slash female connection areas and you can use those over and over again to create all sorts of incredible shapes right so far i showed you the straight section I gave you a little preview of the like the 45 and 90 degree turn, but I want to show you a little bit more detail there. So this is that 45 degree turn, and I found out the hard way that the arc, like you know how tight of a turn it is, matters a lot because if you make that too tight, the train derails itself really easily, as it turns out. So what you could also do is you could take your actual part, like the wooden version of this, and put it in a flatbed scanner. And then using the attached canvas, like you see here, let's turn off our bodies for a second. I could bring in the picture of like the actual 90 degree turn. I could bring in a picture of one of these, which by the way, I recommend actually buying the real ones over 3D printing this because this left to right switch is primo. But you can bring in a picture like this one or a picture like this one and simply use that to mimic the arc. So if you look at my sketches, let's go and find this one. There it is. You can see from the top view that I'm just creating an arc and I'm doing my best to make it follow. But in this original design, I didn't follow it really great enough. And that's why you'll see, you know, my trains derailed all the time, right? But the idea here is that you can create any shape you want. Let me show you how to make a quick bridge. So here I have this example part. We're going to go back in time just a little bit. I'll delete some of this. Let's go and move this a little bit, reorder our timeline a little bit. And I'm going to go and delete most of this, right? So these three things that I have in here, well, let's delete that too. These three things that I have in here, the cross section and then those two um, connection sketches, those are all I need for everything in here. So let's go and do something cool with it. We're going to go and create a sketch here. And oh, you know what? I picked the wrong view. Let's do something else. Let's pick this view. We're going to go and create a quick ske uh, sketch. We're going to do a horizontal line. We're going to do a nice arc going up. Something like that. I'm going to have to fix the tangency in a moment. We'll do an arc over here as well. And then an arc down and then probably another straight line. We can make these straight lines collinear. We could go and make these arcs all tangent properly to each other. This guy and this guy, this one and this one. I can make these lines at the end equal to each other in length. I could also make these two arcs equal to each other. And then I could start to really mess with, you know, how high I want this to be. We'll mess with that in a few minutes. Let's leave that as is for now. Let's go and bring in our cross-section sketch. That'll be this one. You'll notice it's misaligned. That's totally fine. We could go and use J for joint, and I can select the very bottom edge here. And then I can go and select, let's say, this line, and I could pick the very end of it. And it's going to go and line up perfectly. And now I could go and use that sweep tool, select this profile, select this path, and now I'm starting to make a really awesome bridge. Nice. Now don't forget, I can also go and edit my sketch. So let's go and edit my sketch of the height, and this will update the bridge in real time. I have also found, by the way, that if you make the bridge too tall, also the train has trouble climbing. So don't go too crazy on that. But you can go and change this to whatever you'd like. Now, if you're using an FDM printer and you're using support material, great. If you're having trouble with your support material, don't forget that direct editing is still your friend. So you can select a region like this on the bottom of this train bridge and hit the delete command. And now it'll turn it into a flat bottom that will definitely print great. All right, so that's pretty good. And then I, oh, and by the way, our cross section is a little too tall. So what I could also do is go back to my data panel. I'm gonna take this cross section and I'm gonna say, you know what? That was a bad ch change. Let's go and promote the older version and now it's going to adjust back to the original size. 
And over here, all I have to do is say update my reference. And in just a couple of seconds, you're going to see it's going to use the older cross section and change that bridge. Great. Now I can go and take those same sketches like I did earlier. We're going to do that same thing like before, J for joint. And I can select, let's say, this point right there and this point over here. I can rotate that around 90 degrees or 180 according to what I see here. And I could extrude this region and we'll go all the way to the top. And that's looking great. Just add fillets. And on the other side, you know, the prediction would be that I could do the female. But the point is that you could do anything you want. So if you look at some of my examples here, actually, I didn't grab one properly. Maybe this one. Yeah, there we go. You can also make male male or male female or female female. You can make anything you want. That's really the beauty here. So you can go and take, let's say, this sketch. We'll go and show that one too. Should be kind of over here in the wrong place temporarily. Let's go and hide that one. We'll go and grab same thing like we did earlier. So we're going to go and grab, let's say, right over here in the middle. We'll go and put that on the other side here. Rotate, rotate, that's the word I was looking for, this to line up. And then again, extrude this. And we'll extrude this to this top surface. Looking great. Now, I've already shown you the basics. I'm hoping that you're already piecing together for yourself how you could make all sorts of really weird and really awesome parts. So I'm going to spark some ideas again. This was my triple in, triple out clover leaf, right? This one here was my um, kind of like three different direction kind of crossing, each, it crossing kind of thing. And then probably my favorite, I have two favorites that I want to show you, is this really weird looking part. And since you guys are all, well, if you're watching this live, you might be able to comment. If you want to guess what this thing does, this would be a good time to guess. Let's actually turn off my screen for a moment. There we go. Any guesses? Well, I already designed parts like this. And so I thought, what if I took this and I brought these together? Let's go and show you that. So this black part allows me to be able to make a piece that lets the trains go totally across or turn this way or turn that way. So it kind of gives you some more options. But then if you want to take this even further, what if I take this one out and I take this one and I whoop, there we are, flip it to the other side. So now I have yet another variation from the same parts. Pretty cool, I think. So my point is you can make all sorts of awesome parts. As a reminder, you know, in my case, I have this giant bin. And if you remember from those pictures, any parts that you saw that weren't brown were 3D printed parts, right? So I'll show that screen only for a second. Like in this example, only these wooden parts here are the originals. Everything else you see here is going to be 3D printed, including all these bridges, all these splittings. This is that three way in, three way out clover leaf. This is that other split. This is the little bridge area. You can make all sorts of incredible things, right? Now, remember, there's no one way to do this. You probably noticed that even on this, on this episode, I showed you to do the same thing like six or seven different ways. Right? Depending on the file that I opened, there were different techniques used in it. But regardless of which way you do it, the key is having fun and making cool stuff and enjoying time together as a family. So today for our live stream, you know, the intent was to show you how to make train track parts, but I hope you saw that you could use the derive command to make a whole lot of really cool variations of your design and have them all be based on the same sketch for like the connections and the same sketch for the cross sections, right? There's a lot of cool stuff there. Oh, one more idea to throw out there before I forget. Where is it? I think it was right over here. There it is. One of those trains that I had, and I have to turn on the noise for a second so you could see this, right? So you press the button and it starts making the choo-choo noise and of course rolling along. One of the things I found for this train in particular is that after about 10 seconds, the sound stops. 
you you could hear it moving probably if you go by my speaker mic you could hear it moving but there's no choo-choo noise and my son really liked the choo-choo noise this particular train has a little yellow button on the bottom and if you press the button the train actually stops but when you let go again it signals the movement and then also the choo-choo noise so the cool thing is that not only can you make just like a standard little connector like this one i started designing connectors like this one if you look at it from the side there's just a little tiny bump sticking out in the middle and that bump is perfect to press that button as the train goes across it so i can put these anywhere i want in the track and have it also go and make the choo-choo noise whenever I want as well. So I hope today you saw that you have a whole world of possibilities of ways that you could design train track parts, but of course it's not just about trains. It's about designing and having fun and spending time together as a family. I very much enjoy getting to teach you some of the tips and tricks and from my experience today, and I hope you end up making some incredible things. Don't forget, you can always send us an email to fusion360demo at autodesk.com and let us know what you've made using the techniques I've shown today. I thank you very, very much from the bottom of my heart to all the fathers out there. Thank you and uh, good job, well done. And I hope you all have a great day. Don't forget that with Fusion 360, you can make anything. Have a good one, everyone.